Good morning. I was told to stand right on this mark. <laughs> and good afternoon to our special guests. Can you hear me okay, <laughs> Luke and Shana? Yes. Yes, I can. Can you Wonder. hear us? We can. Um, again, good afternoon. The cameras in Portugal are five hours ahead of us. And so, Luke, if you hear our stomachs rumbling, we haven't had lunch yet, you have. <laughs> As a representative of the mission team here at LAC, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here to um, this year's missions conference. The mission team hopes this will be a day in which we all become more informed about the international work being done by our Alliance workers. And we hope you will be uplifted to know God's people are being served in the hard places, as Pastor Dave has mentioned, in the hard places of the world. Today, I have the distinct pleasure and honor of introducing not only a guest, but I see guests. So we are so pleased to see husband and wife combo this morning. So um, again, it is my distinct pleasure. And Luke and Shana, just to prove that we're live, wave yeah. to us, wave. Hey. <laughs> Kevin, it works. <laughs> Luke and Shana Camera have dedicated their lives to reaching the lost in the country of Portugal. Today, via live stream, we will hear about their journey. By the way, speaking of live stream and the technical aspect of this, we really need to give um, a warm shout out, a round of applause, to Kevin Heimbach and his tech team. <laughs> this, this is pretty, this is high tech stuff and pretty special, so thank you, Kevin. Last year, at this same time as our mission conference, my wife and I were part of a group of 12 visiting with the cameras as part of a vision trip. We were not only impressed with the camera's hospitality, but we were able to see firsthand the work they are doing in Portugal. Their unwavering dedication and selflessness left a distinct mark on our hearts. My prayer today is that through Luke and Shana's message, we here at LAC deep on our own commitment to speaking the gospel, to spreading the gospel, I'm sorry, and to support our missionaries in their most noble endeavors. So, <clears throat> excuse me, without further ado, I would like to have us extend a warm LAC welcome to Luke and Shana Camera. And, and guys, it is so great to see your faces again, your smiling faces. Thank you so much for being here. We're so looking forward to hearing from you and your message. Um, again, it's just a pleasure uh, to have you here, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You know, as I mentioned, Libby and I have had the opportunity to get, you got, to, get to know you guys firsthand Mm -hmm. um, being in your home, enjoying your hospitality. Uh, if we could take just a couple of minutes and maybe um, have the congregation get to know you a little bit better. Um, yeah. Uh, tell us about your family. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> this is Luke. I'm Shana. And we have... If you got confused. Yeah, I'm Luke. Yeah. <laughs> we, have four, we have four kids. Uh, our oldest is Kayla, and she is in, at the University of Alabama and in her second year there. And our son attends 
uh, Black Forest Academy. His name's Mayer, and he's in the 11th grade this year. Black Forest Academy is in Germany, and it's a boarding school that a lot of our missionary kids go to if they're in Europe um, or the Middle East as well. Mm -hmm. And we have Ellie, who is here with us. She is 13, and her sister Karis is 11. So they both go to uh, Portuguese. Well, this year it's actually in an international school as well. So <laughs> when we first got here uh, two and a half years ago, it was strictly a Portuguese school, and they've grown so much now that they have over 300, mm -hmm. over 300 international students. So Karis and Ellie, Mayor and Kayla were all uh, the first six that kind of started that. So. Yeah, yep. so our, our hands are very full with these four kids. Uh, the Lord has definitely blessed us with a great family. And Shannon and I have been married for over 22 and a half years. Um, she's my high school sweetheart. So um, <laughs> that's kind of a big milestone. And so we've been married for 22 and a half years together for a little um, over 25 years. Wow, nice, yeah. wonderful, thank you. Um, tell us, how did your ministry start? Yeah, so here uh, in Portugal, uh, in the States, we actually were church planners and we worked uh, in local churches uh, and kind of did that for 20 years or close to it. Uh, and then here in Portugal, our ministry here has kind of started uh, the first year or so has been language school. And so that's kind of what we dedicated ourselves to for the first year. And then in the second year, which we just kind of wrapped up year two, it was part language school, part being more involved in ministry here in the country. And so what that looks like for me is it's been some preaching, it's been some teaching. Um, we've been involved with the College of Prayer here and, and a new kind of ministry for us. Um, we've started not because we asked the Lord for this, but because he brought it to us, just a marriage ministry. And so uh, in the States, we obviously supported marriages and uh, love to speak in a couple's lives. But here it's been much more of a formal kind of marriage ministry. And so we've done uh, several marriage retreats. And we recently just did a marriage lunch or dinner, actually, um, for um, I don't know how many couples were there, 14 different couples. Uh, and it's just been great. And here in Portugal, um, the divorce rate is the highest in all of Europe. And so it's really a need that we were unaware of until we kind of showed up and um, they started saying, hey, can you guys talk to us about marriages? I'm like, okay, I don't feel prepared for this, but yeah, let's do it. And it's been a wonderful ministry. Shana has been very involved in worship. And so leading worship, translating songs. Um, in fact, one of our friends works uh, or wrote an Alliance worship song. And we were able to translate that into Portuguese. And he visited us just a few months ago. And we got to sing that along with him uh, in Portuguese, the song that he wrote for the Alliance uh, here in Portugal. So it was kind of a great circle moment for us. And that's been a lot of Shana's ministry uh, as well, music and um, uh, to families and, and children. Yeah. Um, I also understand a momentous time of your ministry recently, Luke, was you got to preach for the first time in yeah. Portuguese. Praise God. Yeah, so, yeah, it was incredible. Um, it was definitely better than my first sermon in English, for sure. So that, that's, that says anything, I don't know. You guys will be able to judge after today, I suppose. But yeah, it's been wonderful. I have actually have preached twice now in Portuguese, and in uh, December I'll preach again on Jesus uh, in John chapter 11, I am the good shepherd. Um, and so I'll preach on, on that passage uh, in December. So I'm really excited about that too. We've learned through interacting with um, all of our international workers that truly the first year or two or three before they can really start planning churches, it's a language barrier that they have to overcome. And I know Luke and Shana and many of the other international workers um, need to and have immersed themselves in um, language study. So um, final question for you. How did uh, a couple from Alabama get to Portugal? Okay. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh... Luke, for the, I don't know when it started, maybe 10 years ago, I don't know at this point, Luke said, I think that one day we're going to serve overseas, and I said, absolutely not. 
<laughs> I don't see us ever living overseas. We were really comfortable in our ministry, in our home, with our family, and everything was good. And I thought, no, that just gave me anxiety. But uh, in, what year was that? 2019. 19, mm -hmm. The summer of 2019, we got asked to be uh, counselors or counselors, right? Chaperones. Chaperones, Chaperones for the Life Conference down in Orlando. So I had the girls and Luke had the guys and we were in the call to, I call it the call to ministry service. They always do one of those at life. And uh, I always, I always get emotional when I see kids respond mm -hmm. to the call from the Lord. And so I was really excited. And in that moment, I heard the Lord clearly say, go. He didn't wow. say where, he just said go. And I knew exactly what that meant. No, exactly what that meant. <laughs> and all of that fear, all that anxiety, I couldn't even find it. I looked for it and I could not find it. And I was like, this is supposed to be for the kids, but God, God is calling me to go. So um, it was a really, really rough time in our, in our life, in our ministry. We had a really close friend that was uh, battling cancer and we knew that it was terminal. And just, I thought, God, this is terrible timing. <laughs> um, but his timing was perfect. And so uh, I'm trying to make this not too long of a story, but um, probably two months after that, we applied to be uh, candidates to go overseas. Mm -hmm. And we thought that it would be um, Paris. And at this time, I was still distrusting the Lord and not really maybe having the best attitude. I said, God, I know you're calling us. This is difficult. You open the door, I'm going to walk the door. And he opened every single door. And so, and took away so much anxiety. Anything that I had to deal with, he was there and had so much peace. And in the end, Paris was not the place for us, but we had gone through multiple levels of interviews and even visited Paris. But God made it clear to us and the folks that are in Paris that it wouldn't be the best place for us. And we thought, maybe that's it. But we were told, no, we want you in Europe. We want you in Europe. So we had a couple of options to choose from, and uh, one of them was Portugal. And so, um, was it May, April or yeah, May? Yeah, probably. So April of May of 2020, in the middle of COVID, <laughs> we found out we were going to Portugal. And so that's uh, that's the story. Is there yeah, another that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, And that's a wonderful story. Thank you. Um, before I um, turn the program over to Luke, Luke, I understand that there's a, a video that you'd like us to show. Yeah, so this is just a brief video that we've created for our partner churches, such as uh, your church there. And it just um, gives you a little bit more background about Portugal, very briefly, and kind of a call to prayer. It's really a prayer moment. And this video is uh, special to us for two reasons. One is all the pictures that we'll see are pictures that are here in Porto, where we live. And then the voice is our oldest daughter. And so she's narrating this uh, prayer moment video. Nice. But I hope this is a, uh, a good transition, a good way for you guys to get a little bit better of a picture here of Portugal. Well, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. And uh, again, just great seeing you and um, looking forward to your message. God bless. Great. Thank you, Dave. Jesus says in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved. In Revelation 3, 20 through 21, the Lord says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. In the words of Paul in Colossians 4.3, Pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ.
Well, good morning, church family. How are you guys doing? Doing well? Let me see you wave back at me. There it is. Perfect. Perfect. I see a good waver in the front. I think I can't tell. It's a little dark. Is that you, Dave, and Libby? Saying that it's waving at me in the front. Perfect. Well, guys, once again, thank you so much for allowing uh, Shana and I and our family to be a part of your family this morning. It means a lot to us. And uh, I hope that your missions conference goes well and, and continues to go well. And I just want to say this to start off with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity to the Great Commission Fund. It, it supports our work here in Portugal, but it also supports 700 Alliance workers around the world. And so thank you. It, it is a, a huge sacrifice, and I know uh, it is a huge commitment on your part. And so uh, I appreciate it. If you never hear anything else from a missionary, uh, make sure you remember that I thanked you for this moment because it really is big and it really is a huge moment uh, for your generosity. So thank you once again. Um, I think you uh, heard a little bit about our story, about how we got here in Portugal. And um, it's really a fascinating story, one that we were super happy in the States. We were having an impactful ministry. We were seeing lives change. We were making disciples. We were involved uh, in church planning, not just a church that we started, but also other churches that uh, were being planted. And it was just a wonderful uh, ministry that we had. And when the Lord called us to go, it wasn't just an overnight process. Uh, as Shana said in her testimony and sharing the story, we, we applied to the national office, the uh, international placement office there in Columbus, Ohio. At the time, it was in Colorado. Some of you might know that the national office has been moving or has moved. And uh, at the time we applied, and from the initial application, there was a long uh, uh, form. We had to fill out an application, uh, and then we had an initial interview, and then we had a second interview, and then we had uh, physical examinations, uh, not just us, but our children as well. And then we had psychological uh, examination where we met one-on-one -on -one with a counselor for us and our family as well. And then we flew out to Colorado for an in-person, face-to-face, half-a-day interview, uh, multiple hours. People were Zooming in from, from Europe and from Alabama as we were there in Colorado. And uh, it was a long process. And even then, the board of managers here, the board of directors and the alliance still had to approve us uh, before we could be sent. It, it wasn't an overnight process. And even part of that, we had a church family we had a church district and other churches and other ministries that were praying for us and encouraging us and being a part of what it looked like for us to go, for us to be sent. It wasn't just us kind of alone somewhere. It was us part of this larger family that was being sent. And so it, it really was this, um, this incredible process. Um, but it was hard for us to go. It was hard for us to leave uh, our family behind. It was hard for us to leave uh, the impact we were having. But God called us to go, and so we went. We, we, we had to listen to that call. And I know that, um, I know that you there, y'all at uh, Lewisburg Alliance Church, have that sense to send more workers. You have that sense to be missional where you are. This Sunday is your missions conference Sunday, and I love that part of your missions conference is shoeboxes, that you're filling them up, that you're praying over them, that you're gathering them at the front this Sunday with the children involved. I think that's a great and amazing ministry that you're having. And I know that your church wants to send not just missionaries like us, but every booth, every small group that has a, um, a table set up, every one of those international workers, every one of those missionaries, uh, you guys are sending and being a part of their lives. But I also think that if you're like me, you probably want to uh, see if there's uh, a way to not be better, but to, to prove, Lord, is there more we could be doing? Lord, is there more that, that we could be stepping into? And so I want to turn your attention to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through verse 3 here. And I'm going to read this in just a moment as you guys turn there. But I just want to make this note. Antioch 
the city that we're about to read about, this, this passage kind of refers to, is the third largest city in the Roman Empire at the time. You had Rome, you had Alexandria, and then you had Antioch here. And uh, Antioch is not called that anymore. It has a, a different name. And in fact, it was recently, this past year, it was kind of destroyed with that giant earthquake in Turkey. And so it's still a city that is still around. Uh, it's still a place that, that is still um, active, if you could call it that as a city. And so here we are in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And we're going to look at a church that sent people well. We're going to look at a church that, that played their part and played it well. So Acts chapter 13, verse 1 says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mena, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. If we are going to increase our missional impact, every one of us needs to play our part, be it the, the gifted ones like the apostles or like the teachers and prophets here, the sent ones or the congregation, the people. So let's take a look at each one of these. So in verse one there, the beginning of it, it says, now at, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Now, my theology, I look at uh, Ephesians chapter five, and it kind of lists these five offices, right? You have pastor, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles. But here they only list two. They list teachers and prophets. And I think the reason that this is said this way is because those are kind of the two extremes of this gifting mix. Sometimes pastors and teachers are kind of seen on one end, and prophets and apostles are kind of seen on another end of the spectrum here. But I think what the writer of, of Acts is, is trying to get at, the, the storyteller here, uh, Luke, the, the surgeon who's writing this, is he's trying to say that, that everyone, these two extremes and everyone in between needs to be a part of what this looks like to be a sending missional church. And I think you kind of know that these two extremes exist. Uh, you have churches that are called Bible churches. In fact, one of my good friends pastored several Bible churches, and they had this giant billboard on the side of the road calling people to their church, and their slogan was this, if you want the Bible, come to the Bible church. And they would preach book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Sometimes he would preach Greek word by Greek word, and some of you know what I'm talking about. And so you have these Bible churches and these teachers that really love to get into the deep theology, really love to get into the word, really love to dig down into the historical context. And so you have these teachers here in this church, but then you have these prophets. And again, I think we kind of see that today in maybe our Pentecostal or charismatic churches where they have this deep love for Holy Spirit, what are you doing in this moment? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us now? Lord, what do you want us to do in this time? And so you have these prophets in these churches and, and, and in these churches locally, but also in this church here. And I think that it's important that we recognize that both of these are necessary, that we need good theological teaching in our churches because it's the teachers who help us to go deep so that when things get hard, we have a firm theology, we have a foundation on the word of God. And we know that this will not stand because the word of God says this and the promises said this, and I know that I can press into this season because I've had some really good teaching on how to cope with this. But if we didn't have the prophets on the other side calling us to go, and a good prophet is one that says, here's what the Lord wants, wants us to do. Here's the vision the Lord has given us. Here's the next, the next goal that the Lord has for us. Here's the next season of our ministry. We need these prophets as well in your church, in my church, in the church in total. We need prophets to stand up because if we don't have those, those prophetic voices, we will never take the next goal. We will never press into faith, into what the Lord has for us. And so my, my word of encouragement for you there is that the teachers in your midst would stand up and teach well, that they would go book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse in Greek word by Greek word or Hebrew word by Hebrew word. And they would have this deep 
theology that says why missions and why being uh, a Great Commission church is so important. But then I also pray that the prophets would stand up and say, I feel like the Lord is calling our church to this ministry. I feel like our calling our church is to press into the season. And that it wouldn't be a, a fight, but it would be this beautiful blending of these giftings that the Lord has given us. We're reminded that the, the, the Apostle Paul says that we need all the gifts in the church for today. A hand can't tell the eye what to do, and an eye can't tell the hand, I don't need you. We need the prophets. We need the teachers. We need them to work together. And so instead of being a Bible church or a Pentecostal charismatic church, we would just be a, a New Testament church, like this church in Antioch. And so stand up teachers and stand up prophets. Teachers respect the voice of the prophets, and prophets don't knock the wisdom of the teachers in your midst either. The second group of people, the first group of people is kind of these gifted ones, maybe these leaders, right? The second group of people we see in this passage are the sent ones. It says in, in verse 2, the end of verse 2, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So you have Paul and Barnabas, or uh, Saul in this part of the passage, but he quickly becomes Paul, and they get sent out onto a trip. It's actually called, uh, typically called the first missionary journey, and they go where? To Barnabas's hometown, and they go to this little island, and they start the ministry there, and they start to, to, um, to minister and to witness and to see miraculous signs because they were sent. They, 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 they stood up. But this isn't the first time we read about Saul or Paul, and it's not the first time we read about Barnabas. Barnabas is mentioned in, in the book of Acts in chapter 4 as one of the faithful disciples who sold a plot of land so that he could give it to the needy uh, uh, believers there in Jerusalem. And his name actually isn't Barnabas. Barnabas is his nickname, which means encourager. And so right away he gets a nickname, meaning this guy is an encourager. And so he, he does this ministry for a long time, and he kind of comes uh, to be known as a teacher. So he traveled from Jerusalem as kind of a messenger to Antioch. He would, he would go to his hometown. In fact, when he found out that Saul, who was not a believer uh, when Jesus was uh, crucified, uh, resurrected, and rose again, Saul actually was persecuting the church. Saul was putting people into jail and in fact, we remember the story on the road to Damascus where Paul sees a great light and the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaks to him and changes his life dramatically. Barnabas, when he finds out that Saul, future Paul, is saved and has radically changed, goes and gets him and starts discipling him. And so this friendship is formed, but it's not an overnight friendship. It's not something that all of a sudden they appear in Acts chapter 11. They're prepared. This is probably at least 10 years of ministry for Paul uh, before he's sent out. And it's ministry where he's alone for three years, kind of, kind of uh, learning what it means to be a believer, learning what it means to be a Christian, a, a Christ follower. It's Barnabas learning, okay, I grew up Jewish, but now what does it mean to have a Messiah theology? And learning to teach that and learning how to travel, learning how to disciple, learning how to minister to people in different situations. For 10 years, they were prepared to be sent. And I'm sure that there's people in your congregation who are being prepared to be sent. It could be a young couple. It could be a, a teenager uh, in the room right now who feels that call. The Lord's calling me to go. Just like my wife felt the word go spoken to her heart by the Holy Spirit. You might have heard that or are hearing that or will hear that. I encourage you to be prepared. Go to school. Yeah, um, uh, find out what school uh, you need to go to, to uh, in order to be prepared to work overseas. For me and my wife, even though we weren't going to go overseas originally, we did get a Bible degree. And so my major was in pastoral ministries with a minor in Bible. My wife was in music with a minor in Bible. And so we were prepared uh, educationally to work overseas. But then we also were prepared by the sense of volunteering, and so we, we worked in the, the nursery at our church. We helped out with children's ministry. I was a camp counselor for many years, all in my high school years, all in my college years. 
just to prepare myself. For the ministry, I didn't know what it looked like, but for the ministry, the Lord was calling me to. Sometimes we overlook those small moments of service, and we don't think they add any value. But I'm telling you that every pastor on your staff has cleaned and vacuumed and arranged all of those chairs in that room. And it looks like there's a lot of chairs in that room. And every pastor and every worker on staff in that church, every ministry leader, every Sunday school teacher, every youth volunteer has taken out the trash and cleaned restrooms and been the last one to go through the building to make sure all the lights were off. That is a big task. That's not a little thing. It's service. And we're called to serve. If you feel like the Lord is calling you to be sent, whether it's local to go to your local school, to serve your neighborhood, to sit at your coffee shop and witness to the people around you and just be a presence for Jesus or to go overseas. You need to start being prepared if you're going to be a sent one. And it's so important that you go prepared because the work is hard. Whether you do it cross-culturally like my wife and I are, do are doing currently or you do it in the States like we were doing just a few years ago. It's not an easy thing to do all the time. But the Lord has prepared us in so many ways for a lot of those experiences. And some of it is through mentors as well. It, it's, I mentioned this in passing, that Barnabas was kind of a mentor for Paul. We all need mentors. We all need someone to speak into our lives. And so not only do you need to start serving if you feel like you're a sent one and start being prepared theologically and academically, but you also need someone in your life to speak into it as well. It might be a youth pastor, it might be your senior pastor, it might be Dave and, and Libby, it might be someone else in your district, it could be someone else you know, but someone that can walk alongside you and say, this is what you need to do to prepare yourself to be a sent one. And again, don't hear me say that you can't be sent and stay local. You can. You can totally feel the call of God in your life and be the best youth volunteer in the world, or youth pastor, or senior pastor, or overseas worker. I, I don't want you to think that you have to get on a plane to be a minister, to be a, a sent one. You don't. You simply raise your hand and say, here I am, Lord, send me. And that's the qualification that the Lord looks for finally, is a heart that is willing to go. You have to be willing to put yourself in a place of humility, you have to be willing to put yourself in a place where you can say, Lord, not my will, but your will. And it might be going to that grumpy neighbor with a plate of cookies. I've done that many times. It might be going to that coworker who seems a little lonely and saying, let's have lunch today. It could be going to the kid in the cafeteria that, that people pick on and inviting them into your friend group. It could be it could be going onto college campuses and just befriending and having a ministry there. I don't know what it looks like for you, but it needs to have that heart of, Lord, not my will, but your will. So we saw that there's these leaders, these gifted ones in the church. There's obviously the sent ones, the people that are going, but there's also someone else here. It's the people. It's the congregation. And so we read this. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they have fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. See, it doesn't take just a gifted person to go, and it doesn't take these gifted teachers or prophets to kind of point out where the Lord's leading. The whole congregation is involved in these uh, missionaries, these sent ones being sent. They were fasting. They were praying. The Lord was speaking into their midst. Uh, one of the prophets might have stood up and said, I feel like the Lord's saying this. And then one of the, the, the members in the church said, yeah, I feel like that, that resonates with my spirit. And I think the Lord is, is specifically saying it's Barnabas or Saul. And, and someone else said, I felt the same way when we were praying the other day. And someone else that says, hey, this week I've been fasting. And every time when I've been fasting, the image of Paul just comes to my mind. I don't know what it looked like, but the church was involved. You all were involved in sending missionaries. And be more involved. It's not just a, a giving of your money, which is huge. And, and I know it's a sacrifice, 
And, and one thing I'm learning about the American church is the American church is super generous. They're super generous with our tithes, with our offering, with, with, with our gifts giving. We're so good at that. But sometimes I feel like the American church, we kind of shrink, we shrink back from our responsibility to listen. We put it into the pastor's hands. We put it into the leader's hands, but it's in your hands. It was through the congregation that they were set apart. It's through the congregation, hearing the good teaching, hearing the good prophecy, the good prophet saying, this is the, the next target for us. It was through this encouragement that the congregation set apart these folks for ministry. And so I encourage you to stand up. I encourage you to be involved. I encourage you to help out on the missions committee. I encourage you that, that your small group, that you get even more involved in ministry locally, but also with the missionary that you support. I encourage you to, to fill up more boxes next year. I encourage you to befriend people and to listen to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And I encourage you to look around the room and say, I feel like the Lord's calling this young couple or calling these people to, to be sent. And I'm not necessarily saying go up to them and point to, that, to them and say, you need to go, but start praying for them. Start fasting for them. Start talking to your good friend, your spouse, your Sunday school teacher, your youth pastor, your senior pastor, Dave, and say, uh, or David as well, um, and say, hey, what does it look like to send this person? I just feel like in my spirit that this person is the one that needs to go. Be involved in missions, yes, with your pocketbook, but also with your heart, with your prayers, with your fasting, with your worship even. Now, what's the key to all of this? The key to all of this is keeping your yes on the table. So often we, we keep our yes in our pocket, right? And we like to hear the offer that someone gives us first. We like to hear what the other person has to, to give us. And then we can pull it out and say, okay, here's my yes. I'll give it to you. But Jesus doesn't like that. He wants our yes on the table all the time when it comes to him. And so our first response when Jesus is calling us is, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. Yes, Lord, your servant is here. Who should you send? Yes, Lord, here, I am, here am I. Send me. And I know that fear can play a, a crippling role. I know anxiety can get in the way of what it means to be sent, what it means to be a prophet or a teacher, or what it means to fast and pray for missions, to give to missions. But I encourage you to keep your yes on the table. For us, you heard a little bit of our story when my wife shared that, man, we were so excited about going to Paris. The ministry they were doing in Paris fit us perfectly. The city, there's one church for 30,000 people there in France. There's a deep need for the gospel to be given, uh, to be present in Paris, in, in France as a whole. And so in some ways, it was really devastating when they said, no, this isn't a good fit. Because to me, it looked like a perfect fit. It really did. It lined up with my heart for evangelism. It lined up with my heart to go to where the Lord needed us to go. It lined up with, with the ministry model that they were doing in that particular location. And so when they gave us the call and said, not Paris, I really thought, okay, this is it. But I kept my yes on the table. Shana kept her yes on the table. And so when they said to us, we want you to serve somewhere else in Europe. And so they gave us some options, Berlin, uh, Portugal, where we are now, or Spain. And we started praying and fasting and talking to other people, inviting the congregation, the people around us to be a part of this decision. I talked to some really good friends who are teachers. I talked to a really good friend named Larry who kind of has this prophetic voice. And we brought all of these people together and we listened to the wisdom of, of, of those that have gone before us. And we really wondered, okay, Lord, where do you want us to go? And so our yes was on the table. And so when they said, we want you to go to Portugal, our answer was yes, it's already there. And so may you be a church that has your yes on the table. When Pastor Dave gets up and he shares this grand vision, may your yes be on the table. When your small group says, we want to start this new outreach ministry, may your yes be on the table. 
when you feel like the Lord's calling you to go, but you're not 100% sure where to go, keep your yes on the table. Don't put it back in your pocket. Don't switch it out for a maybe. Don't put fear and anxiety on top of that yes. Keep that yes on the table. And I promise you that when you do that, you're going to see the Lord do incredible things through you. You're going to see the Lord do incredible things around you. And you're going to see the Lord do incredible things in you as well. So I'm going to pray for you. I know the worship team is going to come up and lead us in this, uh, in, in a song of worship. But let me pray for you. So would you mind standing? I love asking a congregation to stand. There it is. Oh, I love seeing this. And let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for Lewisburg Alliance Church. Lord, I, we have been so blessed through the church um, and the ministry that they have. Lord, we've been so blessed to be part of the service today, to be included in this, this annual missions conference, Lord. What a privilege it was for us. Lord, I thank you that this is a church that gives and gives generously to the Great Commission Fund. Lord, that this is a church that gives and gives sacrificially to individual workers like myself and my wife. Lord, I'm so thankful that this is a church that jumps on board with a, with a ministry like Shoebox Ministries. Lord, I pray that they would go even farther. Lord, I pray that the prophets and the teachers and the evangelists and, and, and the leaders of this church, Lord, would keep their yes on the table. Lord, I pray for those that you're calling to be sent, be it a young person or, or someone looking to retire or someone with, with the white hair, Lord. Lord, I pray that they would keep their yes on the table. And Lord, I pray for the church that they would keep their yes on the table. Yes, we will send our best. Yes, we will change the direction of this ministry, Lord, if you call us. Yes, we will be a church that stands on the gospel. Yes, we'll be a church that sends our best to go out. Lord, would they be a church that keeps their yes on the table? And Lord, when Satan comes with his fear and his anxiety and his worry and his questioning, Lord, may the, may the voice of the teacher stand up and say, but this is what the Lord says. May the voice of the prophet stand up and say, but this is what the Lord's calling us to. And so, Lord, I pray for this church. Lord, I pray for the ministry that they have and will have. Lord, that they would keep that yes on the table, and then be a church that the Great Commission is not just something that they hear about, but it's something they live, and it's something they do day in and day out. And Lord, I thank you once again for your presence in our life, and Lord, for the ability to say yes to you, because you are a good Father. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.